At the close of Philippians 4 and verse 7, the Apostle Paul referred to the hearts and the minds of believers being kept by the peace of God through Christ Jesus. The particular Greek word that Paul uses there that's translated kept in our authorized version is a very significant and very instructive word. It's a word that means to stand guard. It often refers to the idea of the soldier or the sentinel who is charged with defending or protecting others. It's a word, therefore, that speaks of security or of safekeeping. And, of course, that kind of language, when we think of a soldier or a sentinel being charged with this duty of security or safekeeping, supposes some kind of threat or some kind of danger. The soldier stands guard because he is conscious of an enemy who is seeking to advance against him, take him unawares, destroy him and all that he represents. So when Paul uses the term here in verse 7 in relation to the Christian and speaks of the hearts and minds of God's people being kept or guarded, he is surely alluding to the fact that the hearts and minds of God's people are at great risk. I think it's very significant that right throughout this short letter, these four chapters, Paul makes numerous references to the mind of the Christian. In one place, he tells these believers in Philippi to have the mind of Christ. In another place, he tells two believers who are marked with some kind of division to be of the same mind in the Lord. In chapter 3, he warns them to be careful of those who mind earthly things. And then in chapter 4, he urges these same believers not to allow their minds to be taken up with the sinful cares and anxious worries of this world. Paul's making constant reference to the mind of the believer, constant reference to how the Christian thinks as he lives his Christian life. And the reason for that was very simple. Paul recognized that Satan was determined to cause havoc in the church and in the lives of these believers. And one of Satan's strategies was to have them think wrongly. If the devil can undermine the way we reason, if he can manipulate and distract and disturb and mess up our thinking, he will have gained a tremendous advantage in hindering and harming our enjoyment and our effectiveness in the gospel. The devil has a plan to destroy the minds of God's people. He wants to do battle with us in regard to our thought life. He wants to take our minds off the Lord. He wants us to forget spiritual things and fix our minds and our hearts on lesser things. And Satan, as he goes about that strategy, uses various tactics. For example, he would have us believe that we need more entertainment or more amusement in our lives. There's nothing wrong with recreation, and there are certainly times when we need to allow our minds to be refreshed. But remember, we must remember that idleness and amusement can be very dangerous for the believer. The word amusement first appeared in 1670, carries the idea of pleasurable diversion, or that which pleasantly diverts the attention. Amusement, therefore, takes our minds off things. To muse is to think. To be amused means not to think or to be diverted in our thinking. And the devil is a master at dangerous amusement. He doesn't want the Christian to think. And so he diverts the attention with amusement, some of which are harmless in themselves and some are not. And the devil knows if he can get the believer hooked on television or if he can get the believer hooked on movies or on the internet or on games or on some other form of entertainment or amusement, he will have gone a long way in disabling that person's usefulness for the Lord. He strives to distract us from spiritual and serious things. He doesn't want us to think on godly matters. Furthermore, he would have us think about things that are wrong and sinful. Satan would fill the believer's mind with ungodly thoughts. He did that with David. The sweet psalmist of Israel, the man after God's own heart. David, in the Old Testament, saw Bathsheba from 
the roof of his palace, and then he lost it after her in his mind and his heart. Satan still does that, still works that way. He wants the Christian to have his mind filled with ungodly things. You look very simply at the ungodliness that's promoted in this age. The prevalence of pornography, the sensual advertisements, the magazines, the constant stream of immoral news that flows from the lives of celebrities and fills pages and newspapers, the scandals that fill society. What is happening there? The mind is bombarded with sin. And Satan, Satan wants it that way. He is the sin advertiser, and it's all designed to fill the mind of the saint and the sinner with ungodly and sinful things. Furthermore, he would have the Christian think wrongly about good things. There are things we must think about in life. But Satan would have us overly anxious about those things. That's why Paul addresses that theme in verse 6 of the chapter. He distracts us that way. He also deceives the Christian and makes the Christian doubt. He, he poses questions that makes the Christian query the great foundations of his faith. He mixes truth with error and hopes to poison the minds of God's people. He puts a veneer of respectability over heresy and tries to deceive and delude the child of God, all with the purpose of throwing the Christian into a state of confusion and chaos in his mind. The devil attacks the mind. He targets how we think. He wants us to think wrongly. He wants us to think sinfully. He wants us to think carelessly. He wants us to think in an unscriptural, unbiblical way. He wants us to be full of anxious cares and anxious troubles. He longs for us to be sidetracked and diverted from things that are important in life. He is behind all the wrong thinking that takes place in this world. Satan strives for that because he knows. He knows that wrong thinking will lead to discouragement, disappointment, discontentment, and ultimately a departure from God. That's the great battle we face. That's why we discover Paul speaking so much about the mind of the Christian in relation to the gospel. We are in a battle, a spiritual battle with the God of this world. That's a real battle. And I fear that many believers are misunderstanding the nature and the character of that battle that we are facing as Christians. One Christian writer has said that when he is asked the question, what has gone wrong with modern Christianity, he often answers that question with these words, it has become thoughtless, superficial, and self-absorbed. I find it hard to disagree with him. We're living in a thoughtless age. At least thoughtless as far as the things of God are concerned. It's possible that we find little problem thinking about politics or, or sport or finances or health care or even religion. A little real thinking or meditating upon the things of God. That's the theme that Paul continues with here in Philippians 4, verses 8 and 9. And I say continues with because these verses are all connected. This is his final series of exhortations to these Philippian believers and in verse 6, he urged them not to be overcome with anxious thoughts. He says, be careful for nothing. That is, don't be so absorbed with the things of life that they become consuming to you and all-consuming of you and that you become full of care and fretting and worry and anxiety. Don't be, don't be anxiously careful for things, but carry it to the Lord in prayer. Think through these things and bring them to the Lord in prayer. And then verses 8 and 9, he tells them what they are to think upon and how gospel thinking will impact the other areas of their life. Now, the word think in verse 8, where he says at the very end of that verse, think on these things, is a very strong term. It means to give serious thought to. It means to ponder deeply. Or it means to meditate upon. Therefore, this is a New Testament text that deals with the subject of Christian or spiritual meditation. And that's a vital part of the Christian life. 
It's very important that we examine it this morning. The battle for the mind. The battle for the mind. So three things that emerge from this text of Scripture that I want to draw your attention to this morning. Notice, first of all, the importance of spiritual meditation. The importance of spiritual meditation. When Paul called for the believers in Philippi to think on these things, he was only underlining the absolute necessity of thoughtfulness in the Christian life. He didn't simply want the believers in that city to hear the gospel or to understand the gospel or to accept the gospel and then go out and spread the gospel. He wanted all of that, of course, but he wanted them to think through the gospel. They were to exercise their minds and their hearts in spiritual things. Just as Psalm 1 opens with the word about the godly man who meditates on God's law day and night, so Paul was impressing upon the hearts of these believers the gospel meditation. Gospel meditation occupies a vital place in the godly man's life. Now, there's nothing mystical or there's nothing strange about this exhortation. Sometimes we think of meditation in terms of monks and monasteries. I remember watching a documentary many years ago upon a man, I think it was a Hindu, who had a cave in the mountain. He lived there, and very often he would go up and spend days up there. He would go down to the village to buy food, and then he would go back up into his little cave, and he would stay there for days on end, spend his time alone. And while he was there, the whole purpose of him being secluded in this cave up the side of a mountain was that he could hide away and meditate. He cut himself off from other people with the suggestion he was going to give himself to some kind of religious experience. And sadly, our view of Christian meditation often falls into that way of thinking. We're often tainted by that kind of picture. We think of meditation in terms of monks and monasteries, but that's, that's not the case. That's not what Paul is talking about here. He is speaking of Christians who are going about their daily lives. Remember, these Philippians were real believers. They were working. They were shopping. They were raising their children. They were interacting with others. They had their homes. They had their times of recreation, undoubtedly. They're playing a full role in society. They're going about all the ordinary things of life. And Paul tells them that while you're doing those ordinary things of life, here are things you should be thinking on. Give yourself, give your mind, give your heart to biblical, spiritual meditation. The things that are profitable. The things that are spiritually beneficial. In other words, he recognizes, as he writes these words, Paul recognizes the importance of meditation in the life of a Christian. And meditation remains an important part of Christian living. It's not just something for first century Christianity in the days of the Apostle Paul as he writes this letter to the Philippian believers. Believer, this is for us. When Paul says, think on these things, he's telling us to think on these things. The Holy Spirit is telling us to think on these things. Why it's important. It's important for a number of reasons. Spiritual meditation revives the Christian. It revives the Christian. The Puritan Thomas Watson said, a Christian enters into meditation as a man enters into the hospital that he may be healed. Meditation heals the soul of its deadness and earthliness. In other words, it has a reviving, refreshing, renewing aspect to it. In the book of Psalms, the psalmist said in Psalm 39 verse 3, My heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. I want you to think about that. My heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. The inference of those words is that prior to his musing or his meditating, his heart was cold. Prior to him giving himself to this kind of thinking, the fire was not burning. But as he mused or as he meditated, his heart began to burn. And proper meditation upon the things of God has a reviving dimension to it. How many a believer? 
has come before God full of lethargy and weariness and spiritual coldness. Hearts are heavy. Perhaps we're down in the depths of despair for some reason. Things are not going the way we want them to go and we come into our room or our place where we meet with God and we open up the scriptures and we read through the scriptures and we take time to pray and we meditate upon it. And as we do so, we find our hearts beginning to warm. Our souls beginning to be stirred. Our minds beginning to be refreshed. That cold heart beginning to thaw. And the grace of God beginning to flourish in our souls afresh. What's happening there? Your thinking upon the things of God has a reviving aspect, a reviving impact. How important it is that we do that and enjoy those reviving moments that the Spirit of God is pleased to give us. Spiritual meditation revives the Christian. Spiritual meditation educates the Christian. It's impossible to be persistent in meditation and not grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The longer the disciples spent with the Savior the more they knew of him. And the longer we spend thinking over, chewing over in our minds the things of Christ, the more we do that, the more we will get to know him. We will learn things of Christ as we meditate upon him that will thrill our hearts. We will learn things of Christ that will expose our minds and our hearts to the riches of his grace to the beauty of his person, to the blessings of his gospel, and to the power of his work, Christ will become very precious to us. Fill your mind with the things of the world. Fill your minds with things of self. And we're going to miss out on that. But meditate on the things of God. And you will, you will increase in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because spiritual meditation not only revives the Christian, it educates the Christian. And the more we think of Christ, the more lovely Christ will become to us. Spiritual meditation comforts the Christian too. It comforts the Christian. One writer commented, meditation will lead to a calmness of disposition, a serenity of mind, and a certainty of the ways of God. Listen to what he's saying. Meditation will lead to a calmness of mind, a calmness of disposition, a serenity of mind, and a certainty of the ways of God. And I sense that's exactly what these Philippian Christians needed. There is undoubtedly a link between verse 6 and verse 8 of this chapter. In one, Paul says, be careful for nothing. In the other, he says, think on these things. And as we think on the things of God, as we meditate on the person of Jesus Christ, as we meditate upon the work of God, the majesty of God, the providence of God, the sovereignty of God, the grace of God, the compassions of God, the purposes of God, the decrees of God, as we meditate upon those things, we'll discover we have less and less reason to be overcome with sinful anxiety. Meditation is going to reveal the comfort of the gospel to our hearts. I can't help but think of the words of Isaiah 26 and verse 3. Where the prophet says, Thou will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Thou will keep him in perfect peace. Who will be kept in perfect peace? The one whose mind is stayed upon the Lord. Stayed upon Jehovah. Finding perfect peace and rest. And the more we meditate upon the gospel, the more we think as Paul is exhorting these Philippian believers to think, the more we do that, the more we will be comforted through the gospel. Spiritual meditation refocuses the Christian too. If our minds are fixed on godly things, they will not have time to be filled with sinful things. If it's true, the devil finds work for idle hands, and he does. 
It's also true he finds thoughts for idle minds. We, we will be thinking about something. And Satan will fill our minds. He, he, he will want us to think about the things of the world. Things that are not good for us to be thinking about. Sinful things. Things that are going to draw us away from Christ. And sometimes that happens to us. Our minds are drawn away. It's then we need to give our minds to meditating upon the things of God. And when we do that, we will be refocused. Why does Paul constantly tell the Christians, look unto Christ, the author and finisher of your faith? Why does he tell them to consider Christ? Because he knows there are times when our minds are drawn away from that and we lose out on Christ, so we meditate upon him and our minds are refocused. Then spiritual meditation gladdens the Christian too. It's not without significance that this call to meditate comes in the same section of the letter where Paul has urged the Christians to rejoice in the Lord. In fact, what follows after verse 4, where he says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice, these things that follow, these exhortations, are all designed to encourage the rejoicing of God's people. That's why he tells them, Let your moderation be known unto all men. Let let your gentleness, your Christ-likeness be known unto all men, because there's a joy in doing that. Remember, the Lord is at hand. There's a joy in remembering that Christ is returning and one day we shall be with him. Then he adds, be careful for nothing. There's a joy that floods the Christian soul when we're not overcome with sinful anxiety. And then verse 8, he tells us, think on these things because thinking upon the things of God, meditating upon the things of God, tends to the joy of God's people. It's not without significance that in Psalm 1, The psalmist speaks there about meditating in God's law day and night. It opens with the word, blessed is the man. Oh, the happinesses of the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor takes a seat among the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in that law, he meditates day and night. He's the happy man. He's the happy man. In a book published recently entitled God's Battle Plan for the Mind, David Saxton said, Meditation might not produce earthly blessings like great wealth, the reduction of trials, or a better job. However, the blessings that flow from a mind fixed on God's truth are greater, higher, and more valuable than anything this world could possibly offer. Through meditation, a feeble person is turned into one who is confident in God's grace. The importance of spiritual meditation. Think. Think on these things. That's why Paul urges these believers to think. That's why we are urged to think. Of all people in this world, believers ought to be the most thoughtful. And thoughtful in regard to spiritual matters. Do we we expect to thrive in our Christian lives if we're not thinking about the things of God? Do we expect to become more like Christ if we're not thinking about Christ? Do we expect to be of use to other believers and to non-believers and witness to them if we're not really concentrating our minds upon things that are spiritual and biblical and glorifying to God? Do we expect to rejoice in Christ if we're not contemplating Christ? Think on these things, he says. The importance of spiritual meditation. Look at the substance of spiritual meditation too. Paul not only exhorts the Christians in Philippi to think, he tells them what they are to think on. Look at verse 8 and note the words very carefully. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Just pick out the words that he mentions there. Think on things that are true, as opposed to things that are false, things that are right and holy, things that pertain to gospel truth, things that are true. Think on things that are true. Sometimes we think upon things that are just gossip or rumor. 
no benefit to us at all. Little, little snippet of information. And our minds, we allow our minds to run with that and we think upon that gossip or we think upon that rumor. Whether it's true or not or whether we think there's any truth to it or not doesn't really matter. We think upon it. Paul says, think upon things that are true. Think upon gospel truths. The truth of the gospel. Think upon things that are honest or honorable or grave or dignified. Honorable things. See, Satan wants us to think on things that are dishonorable. Things that are not dignified. The Holy Spirit tells us think upon things that are honest. Think upon things that are just. The word means righteous or equitable or fair. Things that are righteous. Things that are pure. In contrast to the impurities and sins and wickedness of this world. And what, what impurity there is in this world. We, we live in an age that's just saturated with sin. We are to think upon things that are pure. Whatsoever things that are lovely, things that are pleasing or pertaining to love, things that are of good report, means things that are appealing or well-sounded. It's the only time in the New Testament the word appears here. Then he adds, if there be any virtue or any praise, and the word virtue means excellent, the word praise pertains to that which glorifies God. It's quite a list. It's quite a list. Things that are true, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtue, and praise. It's a very challenging list as well. It reminds me actually of what you find in 1 Corinthians 13. When Paul describes what love is and what love does. It's very easy to read 1 Corinthians 13 and think, well, we pretty well match up there. Until you start reading every little phrase by itself. Love thinketh no evil. Love suffereth long. Love is kind. Love is patient. Those are challenging statements. Very challenging statements. And this list is a very challenging list as well. And it's surely designed to teach us that we ought to focus our minds upon those things that are gospel-centered and therefore worthwhile. We're not to think on things that are spiritually harmful to us. We're not to fill our minds with the world. We're not to open the doors of our mind, open the doors of our hearts to sinful thoughts. Rather, we are to think upon those things that pertain to godliness and righteousness. But I don't think that gets to the heart of this. Certainly there, very much so. But look at the words again. True, honest, just, pure, lovely, good report, virtue, and praise. And tell me, where do you find all those things in one place? Or where do you find all those things in one person? Where are all those graces most clearly seen or most clearly set forth? And the answer is in Christ. It's in Christ. Think of Christ and think of him being true and honest and just, and pure, and lovely, and virtuous, and excellent, and praiseworthy, and glorifying God. And surely what Paul is teaching with that thought in mind, surely what Paul is teaching here is get your minds fixed on Christ. Meditate on Christ. Consider Christ. Now that kind of exhortation, coming here in Philippians chapter 4, is in keeping with so many of other of Paul's exhortations How often does he not say, look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Consider the apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. He's constantly telling his readers, constantly telling believers, get your mind on Christ. Get your thoughts on Christ. Get your eyes on Christ. Get your your sight on Jesus Christ. He's doing the exact same thing here. Think on these things. Think on Christ. Meditate on Christ. Let Christ be the sum and the substance of all your meditation, of all your serious thinking. Let Christ be the focus of it. Now that's important because we are not to be taken up with self. We live in a self-absorbed world. and We have a tendency to be self-centered. 
and self-indulgent. We, we like to think, if we're really honest with ourselves, we like to think of self at every opportunity. We, we are naturally selfish. Paul deals with us right throughout this letter. We are naturally selfish, and we are surrounded by naturally selfish people. We want to think of ourselves. Paul says, no, think on Christ. And if you're going to think of yourself, think of yourself in Christ. We're not to be taken up with self. We are to be taken up with Christ. See, if we start looking at ourselves and thinking upon ourselves, Satan's going to use that and we're going to be filled with pride. Let this mind be in you, he says in Philippians 2, which is also in Christ Jesus. He speaks of who Christ is and Christ being equal with the Father, and then he talks about Christ humbling himself. Paul says, let, let that mind be in you. Let's not be full of selfishness and self-centeredness. Think on these things. Think on Christ. Furthermore, we're not to be taken up with thoughts of others. How often do we spend time making heroes out of other people? There's nothing wrong with following a good example. We ought to do that. Paul tells believers that, follow me as, as he's following the Lord. Very important. But those people have faults and they have flaws. That's so why it's good to follow the example and we can benefit from them to some degree. Let's save our deepest and highest thoughts, not, not for some hero that we have on earth, but to save it for Christ. Think on these things. And we're not to be taken up with unnecessary thoughts either. And that takes us back to verse 6. Be careful for nothing. But think on these things. And we're always being brought back to Christ. Always being brought back to the Savior. And that's in perfect agreement with what the psalmist teaches elsewhere. Psalm 104, verse 34. What does the psalmist say? He says, my meditation of him shall be sweet. I will be glad in the Lord. My meditation of him shall be sweet. We see the same thing in the Song of Solomon. When the bride is asked the question in Song of Solomon chapter 5, what is thy beloved more than another beloved? Remember the context there. He had come to her door and she refused to answer the door. And when she eventually got up to answer the door, he had withdrawn himself and she goes in search of him. She comes across the daughters of Jerusalem. She asks them, have you saw my beloved? And, and, and if you have, can you tell me? And they say, well, what is your beloved more than another beloved? And that question was the spark that lit a fire of emotion as she begins to describe her beloved. And she describes him in all his beauty until she comes almost as if she has exhausted her mind and her thoughts and the English language. And she cries in our Authorized version, yea, he is altogether lovely. This is my beloved and this is my friend. And she exhausts her language. How does she describe him like that? Because she has been taken up with him. She has meditated upon him. I understand today we have many things to think about. There are many demands on our minds. But let us never neglect meditating on Christ. Let us develop a love for the Word that reveals Christ to us. If we're going to meditate upon the Savior, we need to be believers of the book. Because this book reveals Christ to us. If we're going to meditate upon those things that are honest and true and just and pure and lovely, and of good report, and virtuous, and full of praise. We, if, we're, if we're going to meditate upon Christ, we need to give ourselves to the Word of Christ. Let us nurture a hungering for prayer where we come to the Father's throne in Christ's name. When you fellowship with God, you pour out your heart in prayer in Christ's name. 
and meditate on the fact that it is in his name that we come to the throne of grace. Let us view all the doctrines of Scripture in the light of the glory and the beauty of Christ. Let us consider all the practical duties of Christian living through Christ and for Christ and by Christ and with Christ. And let us consider all the trials that we face as coming from his loving hand and with a great measure of his sustaining grace. Consider the promises that are yea and amen in Jesus Christ. Bring all your cares, your concerns to Christ because he cares for you. Consider, consider Christ. Fill your mind with the highest, the greatest, the deepest, the loftiest thoughts of Christ. Read the word prayerfully, carefully, devotionally, continually praying to the Holy Spirit of God. Spirit of God, my teacher, be showing the things of Christ to me. Thinking, thinking on these things. We can do that as we go about our day-to-day work. As you drive your car, as you're with your children, as you're at the kitchen sink, as you're going about your work, whatever it happens to be, read the Word, meditate upon that Word, think on these things. And anything that's going to come in, by way of amusement or entertainment that's going to draw your mind away from the proper consideration of Christ. It's going to fill your mind with sinful things. Let's put that from us. Let us cultivate that meditation upon the things of God. Our minds, as I've said, will be taken up with other things. We have things, legitimate things we've got to give attention to. Of course we have. Of course we have. But as God enables us throughout the day, as God enables us throughout the day, let us meditate upon Christ. Let's think on these things. Notice lastly here, not only the importance and the substance, notice the evidence of spiritual meditation. Look at verse 9. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do and the God of peace shall be with you. That's what he says there. Those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. Not just think on these things, but now do these things. The things that ye have seen and learned and heard of me, now do them. What's he, what's he talking about here? Paul is saying very simply, and you've heard this very often, right living, right thinking leads to right living. Think on these things, and I do these things. There's the evidence of spiritual meditation. It will be seen in our lives, how we live, how we interact, how we respond, how we react how we deal with circumstances, how we deal with situations in life, how we make decisions, how we arrive at various choices that we have to to make, how we live for Christ. Those things that you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me, do. You show me a careless Christian who's living close to the world and blown about by every newfangled idea. And I'll show you a Christian who is weak in his meditation. Lot was not thinking straight. Lot was not thinking straight when he pitched his tent towards Sodom. The Bible in that passage in Genesis 13 tells us that the people of that city were exceedingly sinful. And Lot... Lot pitched his tent there, in that direction. Then he, he dwelt there. He settled in that place. What, what made a man, a just man, a justified man, what made him pitch his tent towards Sodom and eventually live in that city? But if you trace Lot's life prior to that, you find him out with his uncle Abram, But you discover that it's Abram who builds the altars. 
It's Abram who offers prayer. It's Abram who takes the lead in family worship. And it gives rise to the thought that Lot was weak in his devotion. He was weak in his meditation. And as he was weak in his devotion, he became worldly in his desires. And he pitches his tent towards Sodom. And we know what happened in the aftermath of that decision. But the Christian who meditates, who gives himself to proper thinking, will be guided and directed in the ways of the Lord. His heart will be thrilled. He'll be revived. He'll be educated. He'll be comforted. He'll be gladdened. And he will have grace and no grace and desire grace to do that which he has read in Scripture, which he has seen in others, that which will bring glory to God's great and holy name. Paul is showing these believers right from the beginning of this book that they are complete in Christ. So he reminds them, especially in chapter 3. Remember, there were people who had come in to that congregation and told them, now you've got to be circumcised before you're fully accepted. And Paul says, no, 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 you're accepted in Christ. They are complete in Christ. He speaks about their justification, about the righteousness of Jesus Christ being imputed to them, that righteousness of God which is received by faith. He is very strong on their justification. He makes that very clear to them. And now he exhorts them. Think on these things. Don't be overcome with anxious worry. Don't be overcome with sinful anxiety. Be careful for nothing in everything by prayer. In everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Now finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, think on these things. Meditate upon them. Give yourself to careful consideration of them and the God of peace shall be with you. What does that mean? It means you will know the presence of the Lord with you. You'll be conscious of that. You'll be conscious of that. And believer, there is grace for us to do these things. We're in Christ. And what he says in verse 13 is very important. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. That's a very important text. We'll come to that not next Lord's Day, but the Lord's Day following, God willing. It's a misunderstood text, very often misapplied text. How can we think on these things? I can do all things, even thinking on these things, through Christ which strengtheneth me. There's the grace. We're told, here's what we need to do. And having Christ, you have grace to do it. What a glorious Savior we have brings us all back to Christ. The battle for the mind. May our great God and Savior give us victory. May we think on these things that we might know the presence of the God of peace with us. Not just today, but in the days to come. When temptations come and fiery darts come and Satan comes with all of his attacks, May our minds be well armed with the gospel that we can live and enjoy Christ with all our hearts. May the Lord bless his word to our souls today for Jesus' sake. Let's seek him in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank thee for thy word. We pray today you'll bless it to our hearts. We thank thee for the exhortation, the encouragement of this passage. We pray, Lord, that would help us to think upon these things that are profitable and good for us. Reveal Christ more and more to us, we pray. And Lord, guard us from the awful assaults of hell and Satan would battle for the mind. We pray for constant victory. We pray, Lord, we might have the mind of Christ. So here and answer prayer. Grant thy word that it might be a resting place, find a resting place in our hearts. And in doing so, bring glory to thy great name. Here and answer prayer. And bless us now as we part. Bring us back again tonight. Be with us in our evening service. Be with us throughout this day. Keep thy good hand on us, we ask. In our Savior's precious name. Amen.